Uh, I appreciate that the housing market in the United States is uh, significantly different than it is here in Vancouver. But uh, would anyone chance or uh, take a stab at a projection on where the rental market is going in Vancouver? The rental market? Yes. Well, I, I'm no expert on the, we have never bought rental properties in Vancouver because we basically we can't make the numbers work. Um, but the demand for rental uh, in Vancouver has always been huge. And as far as I know, there's been almost no supply built in the last uh, 20 or 30 years, which is why the vacancy rates are so low. So the, the challenge is that there are a lot of uh, investors, especially offshore investors, that are willing to pay cash for an asset, earn a 4% return, more or less know that it's going to tick along with inflation, and very, very tough to compete with that You know when you're trying to generate a much higher cash flow. So my guess is the Vancouver marketplace you know, is probably not dramatically going to change. I'd be very surprised if cap rates went up a lot uh, on the rental side. I don't know what you guys think. The, the difficulty with the real estate market in Vancouver is, is that you often have to put inflation into the equation in order to make it work. And if you don't believe that there's inflation coming into the market for the next little while, it's, uh, um, it's a very difficult market to, uh, I, think, I think that there's more attractive places to put money for um, in rental apartments than Vancouver if you don't expect the market to go up. Uh, and my, my personal opinion is that I think we're going to see a flat market for a while. We might not see a drop, but a flat market while there's still inflation over five years is effectively a, a market that's declined. Uh, just to be clear, what, were you referring to multifamily residential uh, rental or simply buying a condo and renting it out? The latter. The latter, okay. All right. Well, I think that's a bit of an easier decision. Um, as a firm, we're not in favor of that. We, we probably have never actually been in favor of that. Uh, part of the reason is that at the individual level, by the time you factor in the risk that you could, you know, you lose a single tenant, you have 100% vacancy. Uh, so that's a huge risk from a, a rental perspective. And generally speaking in Vancouver, whether it's housing or condos, you're lucky to get maybe a 25 or 3% net after expense yield. Uh, based on the prices you have to pay and the rents you can reasonably get. So uh, I'd be far more inclined, you know, even though I generally prefer hard real estate to REITs, there are a lot of great rental apartment REITs in Canada, some of them really well run, and, I, and yielding far more than 25 to 3%, and that have performed well over the last 10 or 15 years. I'd be much more inclined, if I wanted to be in the rental space, to be in that space as opposed to buying an individual condo and renting it out as an investment strategy. Also, if you're using leverage, interest rates have never been lower. Yeah. And so over a longer term, you've got to expect that interest rates are going to go up, which could have a negative impact. Yeah, absolutely. We own a condo now um, in Vancouver. And uh, would your advisors be able to, if we were to give them the numbers uh, that we're currently, it's costing us and the amount of money that's coming in, would uh, Phil or Carolyn and one of the others be able to actually provide what kind of an actual real, like what are we getting for return that we could get a, a, yeah, an actual yeah. number? They'd the, be able to put that together for me? Yes, they could, they could calculate the net yield from all of your expenses from a, an adjusted perspective. And, and maybe more importantly, then try to look and the best comparisons in the marketplace are to compare it maybe with publicly traded REITs that are in exactly the same space. You know, that only, not, like not all, the most conservative real estate trusts you can buy are those that own apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. You know, they have the, the most stable income supply. Um, they tend to be less volatile and there's a lot of very good solid ones, including Boardwalk, for example. And so you compare then and say, all right, if I, if I have a condo worth $500,000 with a $200,000 mortgage, and I could sell it and net, say, you know, after commissions, $275,000, how much income would I get in an apartment-based REIT on that same $275,000? And how does that stack up to the income I'm getting today? Generally, when we've done this comparison, for most people, the income is double. 
what they're currently making. Yeah, because as it sits right now, we, we hear numbers that uh, we could get such and such a percent or such and such, you know, they're all very vague and, and nebulous and, and hypothetical. But if we actually took our numbers and, and crunched them, then suddenly the emotional attachment to having a, a, a place of your own kind of evaporates when you realize how much you're using, how much you're pay, having to pay for the emotions of saying that spot is the place we have. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. On the screen, uh, the beginning of the presentation, I think it was John Nicola, uh, was indicating that Spire is currently um, investing in Canada and the States, and it said other countries. Are you considering no. offshore investments? No. no. Did I say it was in other countries? No, there was a, one of the indications on the screen was Canada, the States, and other markets. When you were talking about world real estate markets. Oh, I see. No, I, I, well, that's probably because I think it's Saskatchewan is another country, but then, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to yeah. confuse the issue. Right. Yeah. In Greece, it's part of Canada? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly so, as it should be. So you're not, you're not going offshore? No. What are you borrowing money for? Uh, what kind of rates are you getting in the U.S. on uh, uh, this boring. last deal, uh, the one that we're going to be doing in the next week or two uh, in Jacksonville, Florida, the, that's a 10-year loan uh, for 4.66%. Was Florida not one of your areas that you said was kind of down and out? Well, uh, certainly in single-family housing in Florida, it's, uh, you, you, it's like Texas, you can't call it a whole market. So um, we will likely never invest in southern Florida. It's just too frothy all the time. It's, uh, it's like San Francisco. People want to live there. There's, there's an emotional factor, and you, you can't justify the market on strict economics, so therefore we don't invest in it. But if you stay in north central Florida, you can make much better returns. So we will we'll unlikely invest, uh, never invest in Miami, but you know, Jacksonville. Jacksonville is a great market. It gets 4% of its employment base from tourism. That's it. It's very industrial, yeah. uh, stable employment. Yeah. Just uh, an interesting uh, point, John, Nicole, at the uh, I moved here in 1989 and thought, wow, this real estate is really expensive. And I, I discovered that Vancouver's real estate had gone up 10.7% annualized growth for 25 years, was sort of the numbers. went from 12,500 to 289,000. So yeah. it can go up. But although I, I think you're, you're right on with 9.6 is getting up there. Yeah, <clears throat> it, it's, it, it's hard to argue with the history. The reality is that this is the most you know, expensive real estate in Canada and probably amongst the most expensive real estate in North America. And that is a reality. I, I'm not sure I expect that to change. I just try to make people aware of the fact that when you look at the, the factors that go into the pricing of real estate, prices in Vancouver, in the greater Vancouver area, can drop. They have dropped. And when they do drop, they tend to take quite a long time to recover. So, you know, people shouldn't just automatically assume that that 10% is some linear thing because it's, uh, it doesn't work uh, remotely like that. Yeah. I just have one point to add to that. I know nothing about the Vancouver real estate market. That may be an advantage. Whenever I go into like, a market and try to analyze it, at least from a residential perspective, there's one simple ratio I was talking earlier about um, uh, with these gentlemen. Take the average um, price of a home or whatever that you're, you're evaluating uh, and divide, that, divide into that the average income in a specific geographic area and you chart that over time. And whenever I've looked at any market, inevitably, when you see that ratio spike, and certainly in the States, you saw it absolutely spike in 2005 and 2006, you know you're in a bubble. So I, I'm not saying that this, this, the real estate is overpriced in Vancouver, but before I made it, I would make an investment personally in Vancouver real estate, I'd do that calculation. And it's not just a data point, it's not good enough. You gotta track it over time, you see what the changes are. I can tell you, when you do that number, you do it in China, it's not that I think there's going to be a, a real estate bubble in China. There's absolutely a real estate bubble in China. The difficult thing is predicting when it's going to pop, but it is going to pop. Um, but that's, that, it, it, over time, no matter what market you're in, that particular ratio has been the asset test for determining where prices are going. Yeah, I think Vancouver is nine times yeah. now. Yeah, but I don't know what it was. Like, and of course, everyone wants to live in Vancouver, but what is that nine compared to like 10 years ago, that, that ratio? I heard recently that uh, TD Bank is going to start offering mortgages worth up to 120% or so of the selling price of a house. Now, I'm, I'm, I think I heard it correctly. 
Um, is that correct? Uh, news news to me. They, um, um, they changed the CMHC rules to tighten actually the rules so that the they still will allow 95% lending to a qualified yeah. buyer with CMHC insurance, which basically takes all of the loan risk off right. the bank. But the down payment for uh, if you're an investor looking for CMHC financing, your your down payment now has to go to 20%. So. So you've not heard this number? No, that's, yeah, that's, well, new, okay. that's new news. Maybe I mis not, misread it or misheard yeah, it, but not we're talking about trying to combine the mortgage I'd and, be shorting and the future I, line of credits that people normally get. <laughs> but it just stuck, struck me as that's the reason we got the subprime. Oh, I, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, Wayman and John. I was just wondering if you could tell what the management fees are for, for, um, for Spire. And, and I guess if you're doing a deal with Ventera, would, would the management fees go up then? Um, the management fees are the same whether we're doing a Ventera deal or um, um, doing another deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, the fees to clients is a half, 500 basis points, so, or 50 basis points. Um, and then after an 8%, uh, after you've received an 8% return, then we take 25% above that. That also works in the reverse direction, which means that if we actually earn less, in fact, if our return is only a 4% return, that fully claws back, correct me if I'm wrong, John, that fully claws back our, in, the entire management fee on Spire to zero. Um, each year at September 30th, or by September 30th, anybody that's wanting to redeem gives us notice. We then do the calculation at the end of December, complete our audit in the first part of the year, and then pay the person out by March of the following year. So six months notice, you get paid out full uh, value at the current net asset value. So the slide that you showed, which showed, if I'm correct, a thousand dollars per unit, now a thousand thirty five right. years so later. So if you if you had given us notice um, by s the end of September, you'd get paid out at what the as net asset value is at the end of the year. So if it had gone up above thousand thirty, you'd get above thousand thirty. If it had gone down, you'd get it at what that value is. And are so we we peg the uh, the value for the year. And are the funds reinvested? Is that option available for the individuals, or is it just uh, taken as um, a profit and taken out of the company? Richard, are you referring to the monthly distribution? Yes. <clears throat> it's uh, your choice. So some, some of us have it reinvested automatically every month and acquire more units. <clears throat> because when you pay out 8% monthly, it actually works out to an annualized yield of 8.3%. So we basically credit, if somebody wants to reinvest the, um, their income in on a monthly basis, they get credited 8.3% towards additional units. At the end of the year. At the end of the year. So then they're, they're simply increasing, because they don't need the income, they're increasing their capital based on which income is being generated. So I don't know roughly, is it like 50-50 now? It's, it's about 30, it, it dropped in 2008 yeah. and it's starting to build back up again. Yeah, so a, a reasonable percentage do both actually right now. Is it the same for the U.S.? Um, the There's no drip US. in the U.S. It's quarterly distribution based upon actual cash flow, so it's not a set distribution. Yeah, so we have to pay it out for now and if we can get some larger critical mass, we'll look administratively at doing a reinvestment program as well. Thank you. Um, I have a question regarding your assumptions when you're calculating your IRRs on your income-producing income properties. Mm -hmm. What hold period are you looking at, and how does that tie into your financing on those properties? You want to take a run at that? That's a hard question. I thought well, you could handle one. You, you're, you're the numbers guy. You get the okay. IRR. I'll talk about the real. All right. All right. So we finance. We almost always, um, uh, you know, take a. Right. When we're doing our spreadsheets, we actually do calculate uh, the uh, cash flow, the return on equity, and the IRR every year on a projected basis going out about 10 years and thinking that beyond 10 years is maybe not realistic in terms of whatever assumptions we might want to use. We factor in the cost of the acquisitions, including legal and everything else to relate it to the cost of buying an asset, 
and also the cost of selling an asset as well. So we're not practically looking at selling an asset in a year. Our, our general view is that we've got a minimum five-year hold on an asset and probably longer. You know, it's, it's quite difficult to find good assets. And so unless we get quite upset about the asset or somebody offers us a ridiculous price that we just can't say no to, basically we intend to hold the asset. And then that reflects, and the way we can deal with this, the financing that we choose, because we are planning on holding that asset at least at least five years. I'm thinking about interest rate sort of debt yeah. risk maturities. Yeah. What we have right now, um, we just refine, as an example, we refinanced last year our self-storage portfolio. Um, the mortgage had come up uh, on the portfolio, so we went uh, fixed uh, five year on uh, one loan. We did floating um, on two loans, and we did a, um, a shorter term on the third. So we try to stagger it. We try to um, do our best guesstimate as to what we think interest rates are going to do and make sure that we're not exposing the portfolio to unnecessary risk because of uh, some spike in interest rates. Is that answering your question? Yes, it is. Thank you. My question is, uh, is there a minimum number of units that have to be purchased at one time? And can they be purchased throughout the year, or are there only specific times that they can be purchased? Um, I'll answer that question. Both John for Ventera and uh, myself speaking on behalf of Nicola Crosby, we only um, acquire assets when they really make sense, and we only take in money when we can properly deploy it. So when we started off, we were ramping up. We took money in on a monthly basis. This past year, we've only taken money in on a quarterly basis. Minimum investment for Spire LP, which is the Canadian LP, is $100,000. Uh, you have to be an accredited investor. Uh, and for Spire US, you have to be an accredited investor as well, but the minimum is $50,000 US. Just to clarify that, for our clients who have already made a minimum investment in Spire, their ability to add to that investment can be done in much smaller increments. This is not apropos to Spire, but just generally, uh, what is your take on purchase of recreational property uh, in the <laughs> southern United States? Don't ask me. <laughs> Everybody who's a client of mine for more than 10 minutes knows what I think about recreational property. John rents his. <laughs> John owns one, and I buy fractional. Okay, so um, I guess that, that, that um, housing generally is not an investment decision. Um, just to prove that, I, my wife and I are building a house in Vancouver. Um, I, I'm willing to bet by the time that house becomes a really good investment, I'll be back in diapers. <laughs> so, so my view on Recreational property is that since I'm using it less than I would use my house, it's not actually an investment decision, it's a lifestyle decision. And um, it, you can't really justify the economic outcomes on recreational property when you consider the alternatives you have, but you can, you can certainly justify the personal benefits you would get from owning one. Was I politic enough about that yeah. one? <laughs> Wayne, is there anything you'd like to add to that? I've owned a number of recreational properties over the years, done really well by them, but I was buying them when the prices were much lower. Now the numbers, um, particularly if you look at uh, some of the expensive recreational uh, markets, it's really hard to make the numbers work uh, when you look at your costs and the capital that's tied up for a limited amount of use. And so that's where I have moved personally um, to where I'll buy what I'm going to use and own a fractional ownership. So it's, it's still a lifestyle choice. I like to know what I'm going to, but uh, I've moved away from owning 100% to owning just what I want to use. I call it uh, uh, expenses, not an investment. That's right. <laughs> and uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, we, there's a cottage for sale beside us, uh, beside our cottage. And my wife said, well, why don't we buy it? And maybe the kids can, can use it. I said, well, the only way I'm going to buy it if my kids are relatively young. Um, and I said, I'm going to buy it if I can justify it as an uh, uh, a rental property. And when I did the strict cold numbers like we do when we analyze these deals, that price um, had to come down by 40 to 45 percent for me to even consider making it meet the minimum criteria to be an investment vehicle. So they're not good investments. <laughs>